Good morning. We're going to start now. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the public hearing of the Committee of the Whole regarding bills number 180162, 180163, 180164, 180165, 180166, 180167, 180168, 180178, and resolutions number 180185. Mr. Stitt, please read the title of the resolution and bills. Bill number 180162, in order to adopt a capital program for the six fiscal years 2019 through 2024 inclusive. Bill number 180163, in order to adopt a fiscal 2019 capital budget. Bill number 180164, in order to adopt the operating budget for fiscal year 2019. Bill number 180165, in order to amending chapter 19-1800 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled School Tax Authorization, to authorize the Board of Education to oppose a real estate tax for the School District of Philadelphia under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 180166, in order to amending section 19-1300. 1301.1 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Homestead Exclusion to increase the amount of the homestead exclusion under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 180167, an ordinance amending chapter 19 1400 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Realty Transfer Tax to increase the rate of realty transfer tax under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 180168, an ordinance amending chapter 19 1500 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Wage and Net Profits Tax by revising certain tax rates under certain terms and conditions. Bill number 180178, an ordinance amending chapter 19 1500 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Wage and Net Profits Tax by revising certain tax rates under certain terms and conditions. Resolution number 180185. Resolution providing for the approval by the Council of the City of Philadelphia of a revised five-year financial plan for the City of Phil Philadelphia covering fiscal years 2019 through 2023 and incorporating proposed changes with respect to fiscal year 2018, which is to be submitted by the Mayor to the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority, the authority pursuant to the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement authorized by an ordinance of this Council approved by the Mayor on January 3, 1992, Bill number 1563-A, by and between the City and the authority. Thank you, Mr. Stitt. Today we continue the public hearing of the Committee of the Whole to consider the bills read by the clerk that constitute proposed operating and capital spending measures for fiscal 2019, a capital program, and a forward-looking capital plan for fiscal 2019 through fiscal 2024. Today we will hear testimony from the following departments, revenue, board of revision of taxes, and we will hear revenue tax bills, and we will have a break at the end of that testimony, and then we will have our wonderful, wonderful public testimony when our citizens get to come in and weigh in on these very important measures. Thank you very much. Mr. Stitt, the first person to testify is? Commissioner Breslin. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Council President Clark and members of City Council. I am Frank Breslin, Revenue Commissioner. I would like to thank the members of City Council for their ongoing support as the department collects the money needed to provide city and school district services and the efforts to launch and expand assistance programs and payment plans for taxpayers and water customers. To continue those efforts, the Department of Revenue is requesting $30,707,541 from the general fund in fiscal year 2019. This is a $662,995 increase over fiscal year 2018. This includes $223,595 in Class 100 to provide for salary increases for District Council 33 staff and to add one new position, a law data analyst, which will facilitate delinquent property acquisitions by the land bank. The remainder of the increase will fund outside appraisal services, I'm sorry, appraiser services, my tongue's getting tied up in a pretzel here. The remainder of the increase will fund outside appraiser services for expert reports and testimony when property owners can test appraisals for real estate tax purposes. Joining me today are Michelle Bethel, Deputy Revenue Commissioner, and Marissa Waxman, First Deputy Revenue Commissioner. We are pleased to answer your questions 
on Revenue's fiscal year 2019 operating budget. Thank you. Thank you. You got the memo. Thank you. Short testimony puts council members in a very, very great mood. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, um, I want to get into this issue about um, Airbnb. Um, I recently attended a conference and they were talking about how things were changing, just generally technology, all the, the world is changing, bottom line. And they, they put a list up about Airbnb and how it was making a significant uh, imprint on the market in terms of short-term rentals. And they actually had them, it was Marriott, Hilton, and Airbnb was third. And a close third, I mean, virtually uh, the same as Hilton. So, you know, obviously as legislators, you always want to make sure that people have new industries and they pay their fair share because they're making money. And, um, you know how we do in government, we want a little piece of the money because we have to provide services to the Airbnbs, wherever they may be. Can you kind of talk to me about, you know, what taxes the Airbnb is required to pay? I mean, they're like, like seem like very miniature hotels to a degree. So do they pay the hotel tax? Do they pay the bird? Do they pay any other taxes? Let's talk to me about this whole Airbnb phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, primarily, uh this goes back to the year the the papal visit. We did a lot of outreach around um, Airbnb and uh, and making it known that short-term rentals were subject to the hotel tax. And um, and we did online filing. And um, and since that time, our hotel tax revenues have risen. Um, they would also be subject, I believe, to the BERT tax. And then, Marissa, you were doing some work on that. You want to? Sure. So, in uh, hi, I'm Marissa Waxman, first Deputy Revenue Commissioner. So, when we updated or when Council passed legislation to clarify in the hotel tax legislation that booking agents, the folks that facilitate those short term rentals, they are um, allowed and to collect and remit the hotel tax on behalf of the operators, whether it's you know somebody renting out a spare bedroom or somebody who's got a property that they're renting out. And at the same time, we worked with um, License and Inspections Council planning to make sure that um, there were certain limits around where and how this activity could happen. So generally, you know, if it's in your home, um, you can do it a certain number of nights a year. And actually in Philadelphia, the zoning doesn't allow folks to say, buy a building and do short-term residential rentals. Um, you know, on a repeating basis if it's in a residential neighborhood. So there are some limits on who's are, are doing this. Are they all done through the booking agent? So not all short-term rentals are done through booking agents. So, so what when about it's, the ones that don't go through a booking agent? How do we track that? So the ones that don't do that, um, they are required to collect and remit the tax directly. And so some booking agents take care of that, some others don't. Some folks, you know, just put an ad up in the window or Craigslist or whatever, and those folks are required. Um, in addition to that, the folks who are operating these businesses uh, would be subject to the BERT and PT if they're not corporations, and for the most part, they're um, not corporations, as well as any, you know, property taxes and things like that. How many do we have in the city? Um, we can get back to you with a number of registered hotel taxpayers. You say you'll get, say that I, uh, We can uh, get back to you with the number of registered hotel taxpayers. Um, but it'll be different than the number of units for tax purposes. Um, for example, if a booking agent is the one collecting and remitting, um, they file one return, make one large payment, as opposed to individual payments for each individual unit. So, uh, do, so do we know or we don't know? I wouldn't know the number of individual units. We'll know the number of taxpayers. All right. So how can we get an accurate number? Because, you yeah. Know, so I'm happy to, I can look and also talking to L&I and planning, we can work together to try and get an answer to that and get some more information around it. All right. So they, Airbnb, and I, I'm only asking because of the presentation yeah. I saw. And they were, so a person wants to get involved in Airbnb, mm -hmm. they have to get a license from L&I? So it depends how much they're going to do this. Um, if you're doing it very infrequently, um, and it's in your primary residence, we wanted to make it as easy as possible to comply because we figured okay. folks were doing this anyway and we wanted to make sure we were getting the tax revenue. Um, so 
for, you do it a couple of nights just when the DNC is in town, just when the Pope is in town, you don't need to get a license. But there's a continuum of, you know, if you're doing it more than X number of nights or if it's not your primary residence, then there are some licensing requirements. So I can uh, go back and try and get more information about that. Okay, so you're gonna get back to us in terms of the registered Airbnb, which if they're not registered, there's no way for us to track it, or is there a way for us to track it that we just haven't? On the tax side, I don't know the number of units, but I'll, I'll certainly talk to my colleagues in l and and planning to see if there's information on the license side that might provide more unit-based information. All right, okay. Okay, uh, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, good morning uh, to each of you. 63% and up, up with 70 in certain areas. Uh -huh. So I have the great honor and uh, pleasure of representing residents in the city of Philadelphia who live in these neighborhoods. They are in uh, Mount Airy, Cedar Brook, depending on what you call it whether or not there's a shooting or not. Uh, West Oak Lane, East Oak Lane, Alany, Logan, Longcrest, Lawndale, Oxford Circle, and Burr Home. We have a high rate of home ownership in that district. The city's home ownership rate is 52%. The 9th Councilmatic District's home ownership rate is 63%. And depending on which region in the 9th Councilmatic District you go, some neighborhoods have upwards to a 74 to 80 percent home ownership rate. Now, I want to, because this is very important to me, just to make sure this is on the record, because this is from your data. The 9th Councilmatic District has the third fewest number of delinquent property tax accounts in all districts in the city of Philadelphia. Okay? Not rich, right? but the third fewest delinquent accounts. In addition to that, we are number one. Did you hear me? Number one when it comes to homeowners who enter into payment agreements with the city of Philadelphia when we know because we're not rich that we can't afford to make the total payment by the deadline, we are the number one constituency, my people, who say, city, I want to enter into a payment plan. It's with that in mind that I want you to know I was through the roof when my office received a copy of a letter that was sent by one of our constituents who apparently was in some kind of pilot about the collection of delinquent property taxes and or foreclosures. And when we received it, I'll be very honest, I said, well, wait, I work very closely with revenue. I met with you, Commission. I met with your team, my team. We're on the phone. We call. Uh, you know, we're not, a, uh, we're not shock jocks. We don't wait to have an issue and send it to the press to get a headline. That's not how we function. We have a challenge. We call you. How in the world could anybody develop a pilot program for the collection of delinquent property taxes in any neighborhood in the 9th Councilmatic District that is number one in making payment arrangements with the city of Philadelphia and has the third fewest delinquent accounts in the city of Philadelphia and then don't even have the courtesy to come to the council person. Because when anything goes down in that district from a city perspective, that's my tale. They expect me to know. And I had to say to my constituent, two of them, I don't know what you're talking about. Tell me how, tell me when, tell me why didn't I know, tell me who received these letters, and tell me was the 9th Councilmatic District the only district in the city? I think those are fair questions, and I'm gonna be quiet and listen. Well, let me first apologize for that and um, say that uh, that was clearly an oversight on our part and that should not have happened and we apologize for that. We also acknowledge all the work that we have done and we're very, very grateful for the cooperation and the partnership that we've had with your office. Um, 
and also let me say that the numbers that you have quoted are correct, that you do have the third lowest uh, in the number of delinquent accounts and also the highest number of uh, delinquent accounts in, uh, in payment agreements, and we applaud that, and that's certainly a, a reflection of the efforts from your office. Um, the specific questions I'm going to allow um, Marissa to answer, she's more familiar with the program, but I wanted to go on the record and make sure that you, you know, it's a lesson learned for my behalf and, you know, we'll take the hit there and we, uh, well, so I certainly apologize for that. Thank you. I echo the Commissioner's apologies. We absolutely should have uh, engaged you much, much earlier in this process. and. Uh, as you may know, the tax man is not normally who folks love to hear from. And so over the past year, we've been exploring a lot of different ways to try and get that message out and find as many different partners and organizations and community groups who can help us share the information about the really valuable assistance programs and the owner-occupied payment agreement program that so many folks in your district have already found really valuable. And so one of the things we've been looking at is how can other people get that message out. And so the information about who is delinquent um, and whether or not they've got a homestead exemption is public information. So there, there's no legal barrier to sharing that information. And so what we wound up doing is providing that information to a state representative so that they could reach out um, and try and help folks get into that program, that maybe folks would be more comfortable talking to someone who, who wasn't the Department of Revenue about how to take advantage of this program. And so you, we absolutely agree that, you know, we should involve the council members at every step in this, that you guys are really the champions who get this done. We've done wonderful events in your district. I think we actually have done the most community outreach events in the past year of the 174 we did. I think the highest number might have been in the ninth district. Um, and so we really value these community partnerships, the folks who know these neighborhoods better than us and are better committed, connected. And so we really apologize that in this instance we didn't go about it the right way. And it was about 161 uh, taxpayers or homeowners who had fallen behind um, that we were that we provided information about, so that the state representative could reach out to them. Hmm. Commissioner, I respect you, and I, I appreciate your just acknowledging that moving forward, we're going to do this another way. But I want to say this to you on a record, and I want to be clear. We're talking about 161 residents who have fallen behind in preservation of their own home and paying their property taxes. Before we have any coordinated efforts with any nonprofits, any elected officials, or any other willing do-gooders who um, all of a sudden become vested and making sure that Philadelphians are paying their fair share, they need to be in contact with the district council person. And was the ninth district the only district that this occurred in? Because I want to know why was my district targeted if I have the number one constituency that's in payment agreements and the third fewest delinquent accounts in the city, why was my district targeted? Um, we also uh, worked with uh, State Senator Vincent Hughes, who was doing similar work to reach out to folks and try and engage them, who we'd also been engaged with through the Earned Income Tax Credit Program. I appreciate, I appreciate you acknowledging that, and let me just say this. I had the great honor and privilege of serving for 10 years in the Pennsylvania House, uh, five of those years. Um, you know, the, the interesting opportunity to serve as chair of the delegation, uh, work with my colleague, Councilman Allen Dom, in that capacity on a bill that gave the city of Philadelphia additional powers for the collection of delinquent property taxes. So I was vested in revenues work long before I arrived. And we, you know, the bill was not only just for Philadelphia, but for the first time when people saw this power that was much needed about to be bestowed on the city of Philadelphia, can you believe that the rest of the state said, wait, this should be statewide. You know, we, every other county should have the ability to do this. Please, don't ever for my people, other districts, I don't think a district council person would feel different, but I mean, for the ninth councilmatic district, I can only speak for me, don't do that to my people. If you partner with a nonprofit, you tell me 
because I have a slew of community-based activities, and I work with state reps, I work with state senators, I work with federal officials, I work with nonprofits. We work together, but it is not together when I don't know, and I'm lambasted with this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I did ask the president just to give me a, a little leeway before we started because I do um, have to leave. The next line of questioning that I have is I want to stay on, on the issue of the collection of delinquent property taxes. And I want to um, ask you, in terms of those properties, one, those firms that are hired to collect for us, do we collect data on uh, you know, their collection rates and how effective they are so we can know whether or not we're getting a return on our investment? And is that included and I just didn't look at it in the data that you shared with us today? We do, we do collect that information. Um, we're always analyzing our collection agencies to see their performance. Um, it is not included in that information that you have, but we, could, we can certainly share collection information with you. So what, what I would like to have um, a, a sent to uh, the president for distribution to all members is, I want to see the performance of those firms that are hired by the city of Philadelphia to collect both residential and commercial uh, tax liens, right? Residential and commercial. In addition to that, Tell me the trigger, because this is something I haven't understood. What's the trigger for when a, an account is sent over to one of those firms? Is it a certain amount that you become delinquent in? Is it a, is it a length of time that you become delinquent in? And right now, is every residential and commercial account that we should be collecting on have we sent those to those firms that are doing the business to collect? Because this is what happened. I'm in Alany and East Oak Lane this past Saturday, and we're going through the budget proposal, and we're talking about what we need to fund the schools, and we're talking about a proposed increase in property taxes, and the folks say, wait a minute, Sherelle, are we maxing out on our ability to collect the delinquent property taxes. So I go through the spill about the legislation. I talk about what, you know, I, the great job that I think you all are doing. I didn't have the data to confirm whether or not the firms who are working to collect for us, how successful they've been. But then the, the, the billion dollar question is, well, Sherelle, has the city sent those firms all of the accounts and given them the opportunity to collect so that we can measure what they are? And I couldn't answer that question. Tell me what do I say when I go back? So, so everything that's delinquent is in a collection status. Everything? The, yes. It's Commercial in, and residential? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's not all with firms because we keep some internal for our law department to do collections on. So basically, so help, stop, hold, go right there, Commish. Internal for law department. Help me understand what's the trigger for what delinquent residential and commercial accounts are given to those firms. So we hire to do that work, and then what's the what's the the rationale or trigger or methodology for keeping them in house to let the law department collect? Well, first of all, there's, there's um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but there's, there's a different collection rate um, internally, and this gets passed along to the homeowner. So our internal um, attorney's fee is 6%. 6%, internal fee. Internal fee. Our two co-counsels rate is 18%. 18%. Which gets passed along. So what we basically do is take the accounts that we think are essentially the easiest collection, and we keep those in-house, and we work those. The ones that are going to take the more significant um, effort um, are divided equally <coughs> between the two vendors. So it's as simple as that, you know, the law department takes their piece, what's left gets divided in half and goes out to the two vendors. So, so one, now let me thank you for just, give, just answering a complex question in plain English. Right, so I appreciate that, but this is what I'm going to uh, ask, and Mr. Chairman, I'll be done. I get the internal rate at 6%, the 18% fee that is charged by these firms. My question, and that the easier accounts 
are given where we can pay the, uh, the lower amount, the 6%, right? We tried to do it in-house because it should be easier to collect. What I would like to see is can we measure the effectiveness and or the success of and, and the time period? Because if we're talking about, let's just say if there was an additional 200, 250, 300 million out there, um, in delinquent accounts that we could be getting that money in, let's say within the next 12 to, to 24 months that we could have on our books, that amount of money that we need to help address this school district crisis that we have right now, not that it goes away, but it is significantly, we started at 966, what's the number now, 674, 6, 670? 66670, right? So now we move down. Imagine if you can, I don't care if it's via internally or uh, externally, we measure how fast we would be able to collect that revenue. We could decrease that amount. Right. right? And, that, and that's something we're looking at. We're always looking at the collection rate of our vendors and our internal collection rate to, to maximize that. In addition, um, starting about five years ago, we started a new process where on the, the real estate taxes are due March 31st, and effective April 1st, they're overdue. They're not yet delinquent. They don't become delinquent until the beginning of the next year, but they're overdue. They used to sit until they became delinquent and then go out and go through the process we just talked about. Now, as soon as they become overdue, we send those out, not to law firms, but to collection agencies and they'll start getting noticing during the year, and that noticing ramps up up until about November, and when in November we send them all essentially a final letter that says, mm -hmm. if you don't pay before December 31st, you know, bad things are gonna happen in terms of, you know, it's gonna be a lien on your house, you're gonna mm -hmm. get legal fees, and, and that's been really effective. So we're, we're kind of on board with what we're saying. We're trying to jump on them as soon as they're overdue, mm -hmm. get them out to collectors, start the process. So we're starting the process much earlier than we used to. We're keeping it with those collectors. We have two collectors doing that portfolio. We measure both of those. We, we, we make it competitive. We let them know if mm -hmm. one's outperforming the other. We let them know where they should be. That's been very effective for us. Um, over the last five years, the um, total principal has been reduced by 31 percent, and the number of delinquent accounts has been reduced by uh, 20, over 20 percent. Um, our collection rate in the year of the levy is at a new high, 95.5 percent, and uh, we're trending higher in the current year, so we're really excited about that. So I think, you know, we have a strategy. We've been utilizing it over the last several years. It's really paying its dividends, and I think that we are maximizing our collection. So one commissioner, thank you uh, for your response. I support your efforts, particularly that anything that we can collect, and we can collect it 12% lower than the private sector can do it, I want to do it. But I also understand the importance of the timeliness of it. So if there is an additional 250 to 300 million dollars, I would love to see a cost-benefit analysis of how long it would take us to collect it and how much it would cost at 6% versus what it would cost if we did it outside, and then that would help us understand how we, how we communicate with our constituency about that. Because again, just think of the number. We moved from 966 down to 650, and we're still talking about a, four, a potential 4.1% uh, increase, and folks are asking questions about it. My people are. I can't speak for any other district. My people. In addition to that, where this council is going to be asked to make the tough decision about whatever the package will look like. So if you could commission that information to us, then you give me the data that I need to go out and make the case for what I feel like the city's plan should be. Okay. Thank okay. you so very okay. much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Jones. First of all, let me thank my colleague uh, for making us aware of this because I just found out that my senator, my good friend, ask for the same data. I do not understand, and we're in good communication. We're in constant communication why the city council person, the district council person, would not be made aware of this. I wasn't uh, blindsided like uh, Parker was by a constituent. These kinds of things, when we go to public farms, particularly when we're going to be asked to make cases 
about taxing, about city taxing, how, how do we get to a point where the state is creating pilot programs for local taxes in our respective districts? I, I don't get that. So how do we get here? Well, I think, again, this was a communication problem and, and it's a lesson learned. I mean, I think we have good communication in general with uh, city council and this was a situation where um, I guess we got ahead of ourselves in, in our zeal for collection efforts and to get the word out there. And this was all, I will say also, this was all um, around uh, the owner-occupied payment agreement. So trying, it wasn't a heavy-handed uh, collection effort, but it was trying to... So, so was there a letter sent out to constituents? Not by revenue, but, but by but the by state who? representatives. We, we furnished them with the data. So, so they fashioned a letter for city taxes. Do you have a copy of it? We can provide a copy, out? yeah. Because, uh, you know, I mean, when I tell you me and Senator Hughes are tight, we are tight. However, we ain't that tight. <laughs> <laughs> to use uh, colloquial Ebonics, we're not that tight. Um, so I need to know what that letter was that went out to my con to constituents. Um, Councilwoman Parker talked about her district being uh, the number one district for those types of agreements. Where does the fourth district stand? So in the, in the fourth district, 32% of uh, delinquent accounts are in payment agreements. And so that puts you second in second place. place. Second place. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and as it should be. Who's in first? In first place is uh, Councilwoman Parker's district she, at 41%. And so we're in second place. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so how does that translate? How many letters went out in the fourth district? Um, they didn't go out from us, but we could certainly find out and get that information to you. Okay. Um, because we're doing town meetings. We're doing budget sessions. Um, the other day, I was up in the 21st Ward, and, you know, first question came out of everyone's uh, uh, collective thought was, you're raising our taxes based on general assess assessments, 11% citywide, but up there, maybe 35%. And on top of that, we may well be asked to pay an additional 4% on top of that. And then I'm hearing about these collections that, I mean, this should have nothing to do with politics, but we are running next year. Can we at least know uh, when we're knocking on people's doors, constituents' doors? Hi, I'm Councilman Jones. Um, we just sent you out a threatening letter about taking you home if you don't collect. I mean, that's not the first thing I'd like to lead with. So that kind of communications is essential. Uh, and to my good friends in the state, uh, House and Senate, I don't go around asking about state taxes and, you know, I mean, I mean, there is a reason why there is a separation and um, unless they're going to, on their end, raise some taxes to solve some of the local problems such as the school district, let them, they, they have a Department of Revenue up there, don't they? They do. But they can play with them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Reynolds-Brown, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Revenue. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councilwoman Parker, in many ways, teed up my line of questioning. I have some additional um, questions that are a result of the responses you shared this morning. So where shall I start? You say that the internal fee is 6% for what the city collects, correct? Correct. And that for your vendors is 18%. That's correct. You also stated, if my notes are accurate here, that you analyze, you analyze what the collection firms do. So let's, let's get behind that statement. What do you analyze? We look at how much is in their portfolio. How much, how much is in the portfolio, okay. And how much they are collecting. Now it gets a little complex because the portfolio is constant is, is changing 
you know, we're getting ready to do referrals now as more. Um, let, let, let's, let's stay with what is as we speak. Okay. Not about what the future holds, because this, this testimony and this hearing is currently based on the practices currently in place. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. All right. So the analysis is tied to how much is in their portfolio and how well they are doing at collections. You gave the number 95.9% .9 collection rates for whom? The city or the vendors? That's, that's our general number before it becomes delinquent. So okay. how much of the real estate taxes is collected in the year of the levy? Okay, let's get behind that number. Break that down. What percentage of that is the city's rate of collection and what percentage that's of that all, is tied to the vendor? That's all before Total. anything goes out to the vendor. Okay, before anything goes out. Okay. Now, you also stated that... Let me, let me clarify please. that because that's before it goes out to the vendors we're talking about at the, um, for the legal services, at the 18%. But I did talk about how as soon as it becomes overdue, it goes out to two collection agencies. Yes. So it will have gone out to the collection agencies, but not to the, um, to the legal services vendors, because we have collection agencies that are collecting it when it's overdue. Okay. Like effective April 1st, they collect it till December 1st, okay. um, December 31st. Then on January 1, it's considered delinquent. Then we pull it all back from those two collection agencies and we get it ready to split the split that I talked about with Councilwoman Parker, um, where we keep the third and the other two thirds goes out to the vendors. So that 95.5 is in that first year from the time the bills go out through December 31st, 95.5% is collected. Okay, I'm trying to follow that. You, you stated that X portion, and you'll have to tell me what X is, goes to the law department. So what goes to the law department when? Basically, it's not exactly, but essentially a third stays with the law department. They go through the delinquency, establish what they want to keep internal for them, and then what's left gets split evenly and goes out. And those referrals will go out in approximately late March, early April. Okay. You also stated that the easiest collection stays in house. Define easiest. Please identify yourself. Good morning. I'm Frances Beckley. I'm Chief Counsel to the Revenue Department. Um, we have been working to diversify the tools that we use, and one of the things that we're really pleased with is a program called sequestration, which can be used before foreclosure. It's cheaper. It's faster. What we do is we take a delinquent property, if it's delinquent in its real estate taxes, and we petition the court to appoint a sequestrator, which is like a receiver, to take the rental income from that property and the court puts the sequestrator in for as long as it takes for the difference between the expenses of the property and the rent from the property to pay off the real estate taxes. The beautiful thing with that is that even by sending a letter to landlords telling them that we're going to put them in this program, typically they will pay us either in full or enter into a payment agreement. We have about a 75% success rate from that program um, and it brings in Currently, roughly one and a half million dollars a month. Um, it also is a, desi a more desirable uh, outcome for rental properties because unlike foreclosure, it doesn't break the leases, so it doesn't allow the landlords. It has no impact on the tenants. Mm -hmm. So when we met with the eviction task force, they were very pleased to hear that whenever we find and can identify a property as a rental property, we put it through the sequestration process before it goes to foreclosure. Only the quarter of the properties that we aren't able to solve through sequestration will then be referred to foreclosure. Now, all, the process that you just articulated, that's that 5% um, that, that doesn't get collected? Yes. Well, I, everything we're discussing now is has to do with delinquent property taxes, which are taxes that are not paid in the year that they're due. Um, under state law, they, be, they have a different status on January 1st of the next year that allows us to use both sequestration and foreclosure. Those processes are not available for taxes that are only overdue, only for taxes that are delinquent. 
Okay, let me back up a little bit. I'm surprised I'm going this long. That bell won't ring soon? You're, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I have here paperwork that indicates that the city allegedly has $400 million in delinquent real estate taxes. Is that true? Um, I can start with the number that there is about um, $158 million in active delinquent principal. Um, and so that is sort of the most collectible portion. Um, overall, real estate taxes do um, is another $40 million in principal. So active is within the past 10 years. Inactive is the older debt older than that, and so together it's about $200 million in principal, and then when you get to include all of the interest and penalties, you get to a number that is... Uh, what about the other two? So, so you're saying the $400 million is not true for, since September 2017? I'm sorry, one moment, we'll... Small print, old eyes, if I did it in pink and purple, jump out at me. 426, including all interest and penalties across all years. Thank you. Okay, have all those addresses been verified? Um, so one of the things that we've put in in the past couple of years is a data warehouse, and within that we add in uh, data purification that helps us go through and make sure that we have correct addresses. It's also incumbent, though, for folks who aren't using the property address as their mailing address, they uh -huh. need to make sure they update us. And that certainly is a challenge that if folks move or are using an off-site address, getting the bill to them is clearly the very first step in getting the bill to pay. So that's one of the things that we really encourage folks to do is make sure mm -hmm. that they've got accurate addresses for any off-site mailing address on file with us. Encourage how? Uh, well, so when we do find them, we. Um, all of our, you know, co-counsel and folks, they do skip tracing, try and track folks down and use outside tools um, to find them if they haven't found us first. Uh, but whenever anyone calls in with a question, our call takers and our call center will prompt folks to get their most recent contact information so that we're constantly trying to refresh and update I that data. I can't imagine the challenge that that yeah. can be. In addition, um, we're also working internally with the records department, office of property data, Office of Property Assessments. We put a task force together, um, and, and basically, it's a property data uh, task force. So that's probably up. a fluid. It's a fluid process, it and that is never is, done. Yes. Never done. So, so it's fair to say that what what percent is verified? Ninety percent, ninety-five percent. Help me out. The I, I don't have a percentage, but the okay. vast the vast majority. How much of the figure represents uh, nonprofits like churches? How much of that 426 million represents nonprofits slash churches? So th that's a really challenging question because if they've been um, gone through the process with the Office of Property Assessment as a nonprofit that is exempt from taxation, there should be no delinquent balance. The challenge comes when there are nonprofit entities that haven't had that verification. And so oftentimes as they move through the process, really the only way that we're able to know that something is amiss there is, is a name, um, is trying to look at what the name is on that property. And so as it moves through the collection process, that surfaces. Hmm. <clears throat> How much of that figure represents properties in bankruptcy? Um, of, there is about $3.3 million uh, worth of principal in bankruptcy. I believe it's a little less than 2% of the uh, total delinquency. And we can get back to you with the exact figures, the most recent ones. I believe those numbers are from the end of FY17. That's a, that's the the a bell really has rung, but I'm, I'm really, I I'm really would like to know what the number is of nonprofits and, and, and exempts. Uh, Period. Can you get back to us with that number? Yeah, we can try. As, as right, try, is not, said, try, it's, try is not uh, an it, affirmative. It's, it's a challenge. It's a, ch it's a challenge to identify those sometimes within the, because they're not classified always as a nonprofit in, in our system. But we'll, we'll, we'll get something back to you. So then lastly, it's, it's difficult to say then that $426 million is truly reflective of delinquent real estate taxes Absolutely. if we don't know what percentage of that mm -hmm. are nonprofits, and well, we do know that 3.3 .3 million is bankruptcy, correct? Yes. Correct. Yeah, and, and, and what you're referring to really is you're getting to um, our actionable portion of the delinquency. Essentially 38% mm -hmm. of the 
delinquency is not actionable. And not actionable is things like bankruptcy, TRB appeals, um, they're in a payment agreement. That makes up the majority of it. So, um, so that's the, not all of the $400 million. So clearly this is a convoluted, complex, layered um, uh, uh, chat issue. My, my ask is that you provide for me or to the chair, I'm a very visual learner, so I, I would really like to see you articulated several layers of actions of activity that can happen once a property goes into delinquency. So some kind of grid or flow chart that, 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 that simplifies and reduces to the common denominator what that looks like if it's a bankruptcy, if it's a nonprofit, if it's a, you've mentioned several different actions. I need to see that to get a yeah. real clear understanding on why a third still stays with the city and doesn't go to the agencies that are in the business of doing this for a living. That concludes my uh -huh. first round of questions. Okay, thank you, okay. Councilwoman. If I could ask real quickly on the issue that Councilwoman Parker brought up, just so I'm clear, because I think it caught a lot, of, a lot of us off guard. We weren't aware of this. Is this a, was this a program just in, in the ninth district, or was this? Uh, it, was, it was really just a one-off to see if it was effective. Okay. Um, to see if it resulted in folks being able to enter into the owner-occupied payment agreement program so that they would no longer be at risk of foreclosure. But it was in just the ninth district at that point? Um, it's, it was there first, and then um, okay. I think word might have gotten around in Harrisburg or that, you know, that it might be okay. something. Um, right. But we, we certainly apologize and would make sure okay. in the future that everyone here would be engaged well before. And I was going to use the word everybody here because obviously a district council person needs to know what's going on in his or her district, but those of us at large have phones too and we walk <laughs> out on the street too and we hear from people too. So I think if there's a program, I think, with all due respect, I think all 17 of us should know. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Dom. And uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Commissioner Breslin and Deputy Revenue Commissioner Michelle Bethel and uh, First Deputy Commissioner Marissa Waxman. And I know that uh, Deputy Commissioner Marco is sitting in the audience and you too, Francis Beckley, for uh, all you that you do and your, and your department. As I will say, I've worked with you all very closely these last two and a half years or so and I think you're doing a very good job. And I am proud to have you in our revenue department. I'm not saying it's always perfect, nothing ever is, and mistakes happen, but I'm proud of it. Okay. Uh, so I, but I do have a few questions, and, and Councilwoman Wondell Reynolds Brown, this may help clarify some of your questions. And I'm also supportive of uh, my colleagues, Councilmember Sherelle Parker and Councilman Curtis Jones, in knowing about it. But the other side of the coin is I'm happy that you had the creativity to come up with a new program, okay? So while we made a mistake in not notifying, I don't want to stifle the creativity of coming up with new pilot programs. I think that's good. I think we need more of that in government. Having said that, the figures that I, because we talk about this weekly or daily or whatever, <laughs> but um, I just want to put on the record the figures and some of the information so we can have it out there and look at it. But as I understand this right now in our budget process, we need about $660 million. And the administration's proposal is a 4.1% increase in the real estate taxes, it's a redu uh, increase in the transfer tax of about 8% and a freeze in the wage taxes that have been slightly reducing over time to get us to that goal. But I do believe, and I've said this is no secret, before we do any of those things, we should be collecting the delinquent taxes and making sure that our current taxes we've collected are managed efficiently. Having said that, I think at this moment in time, I think that, uh, Marissa, you mentioned it's 426 million delinquent. And Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown, when I looked at this figure two years ago, the city had a valuation, and, and roughly a valuation of the whole city. 30% of the city didn't pay any real estate taxes. So they were not, the nonprofits are not in that delinquency, usually unless there's a mistake. So 30% don't pay real estate taxes, 26% of our population is in poverty, and 44% pay the full boat. That's how it looked two years ago. And in the last two years, when you look at what OPA has done, they really have not moved the needle on any of the properties that we don't tax. They're still the same values pretty much. So that's the context. And the amount of dollars outstanding, I understand it's 426 million. And for, for those who may be listening, real estate taxes, typically we only go back 10 years, 
but real estate taxes are a first lien on real estate. They come before the lender. We'll get paid. We're in the best position possible. We are in the best position possible. We come before a lender. So when you go back and you, and you take all the old delinquency, including more than 10 years, that total delinquency is $426 million, and the residents are right. We should make every effort to collect it. And I will say this. The administration, including the mayor, want us to collect these taxes and have been supportive of, of tools and measures to collect real estate taxes. So there shouldn't be any knock on the administration or the mayor for the collection of real estate taxes. They're on board. So here's where we are. We have $426 million of delinquent taxes. We have, I think, and you can verify this, but I know we've gone over this 16,000 times. We have about 124 to $126 million in payment programs. So they're not available to us, basically. And those people are counted as current because they're in a payment program, which is good. By the way, we want to increase our collection rate because it's one of the drivers of our bond rating. Of course, pensions and cash reserves are the bigger ones, but delinquency plays a role. There's 300 million out there, basically. And there's two pieces of this collection. It is the old stuff, and there's increasing the rate. And the rate is right now, which is the best I've ever seen in the city, 95.5. Congratulations to you and your department. But there is an option here to collect the 300 million. So what does that consist of? 67,000 delinquent properties, 16,000 owner-occupied, we believe, 51,000 not owner-occupied. It's almost 75% not owner-occupied. 67,000 delinquent properties, 16,000 owner-occupied, 51,000 not owner-occupied. There's an opportunity to do two things. One to put it on, to give the revenue department a tool, and they have like 20 tools and they keep coming up with more tools, which is great. We applaud the creativity. Give them another tool to collect delinquent taxes. And you probably know what I'm referring to, and that is the collection method that has been utilized in New York City where their rate is 99%. And what's the benefit of this? Number one, we could increase our collection rate by two points. What's that benefit? 30 million a year. What's that benefit in a five-year program? $150 million over five years. What's the second benefit? Maybe collecting a portion of the back taxes. We're not going to get it all. And if we're lucky, we might get 25%. But even 25% is $75 million. So there's a lot here of options. We talked about the rates. When a taxpayer goes delinquent and we assign it to an outside collection firm, the rate is 18% plus expenses. Under the New York method, we believe the calculated rate would be somewhere between 6 and 8%. Over the last eight years, the residents, not us, the residents of the city have paid $52 million in fees to collection firms. If we adopted the program that we've been talking about, the fees could be dramatically lower, maybe 14 or $15 million. And But here's the big benefit. The program we're talking about, which we're trying to get a hearing on, is, has a, a mechanism where we send out notices. We send out four notices, a 90-day, a 60, a 30, and a 10-day notice. And after the fourth notice in New York, 85% of the people pay their taxes after the fourth notice. And by the way, the Revenue Department, was it like three years ago, did something similar, send out one notice. And if I recall, 50 to 55% of the people pay their taxes. So it's the marketing and it's the noticing and we should be doing this before we raise anyone's taxes. So, in summation, I didn't even ask you a question, I've just been talking. Uh, I'm sorry fine. about that. I don't know if I'm to do that or not. You're on a roll. Okay. You know, really, and Frances Beckley said it really well. I'm glad she came up and spoke about sequestration because that is a term that most people don't understand. But I understand the issues. We're not going after any owner occupants here, this excludes owner occupants. Then there's a concern of investment properties, lower income. And Francis Beckley said it beautifully. We have sequestration, which is basically a program where we have investor-owned properties. The residents are redirected, the tenants, to pay their rents to the revenue department so they can offset the taxes. So that's not losing a home. But when you have so many people who decide not to pay us, we need to give revenue that extra tool. We have, I have examples of people I can show you. The guy owns 66 properties. I actually thought he owned 33. I was wrong. He owns 66 that are delinquent. He lives out in the suburbs. We have people that owe us a lot of money. 
And I guess my time at this first round is just to put all those facts on the table. I introduced a bill four or five weeks ago, which was a similar bill with one major change, and that is we, on the front of the bill it says, owner occupants excluded. And with sequestration, it protects low income homeowners. And my question is, if owner occupants are excluded and we have sequestration for investor owned properties that are lower income, why are we not moving forward and collecting delinquent taxes from those people who choose not to pay? I'm gonna end on that note, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Sanchez. You don't need a hearing because you, you just did your uh, whole testimony, although I don't want to have a policy debate because I think Councilman Dom has done a fabulous job in bringing this issue forward, but I feel compelled to put some stuff on the, on the record also. I do think the city has done a much better job in its collection strategies. Um, if you read the reports, Council's proactiveness on UPA and LOOP and other things has led to the protection of, of uh, homeowners, uh, which is a core value, I think, of this council and of folks in poverty who, despite poverty, have home ownership rate. And I am not against collecting all taxes because, like the councilman said, we hear that constantly with folks. How can you increase our taxes if you're not collecting the delinquency? But there are a couple of issues that are become hugely important that the administration has failed to answer um, or we have not put our hands around is, you know, we have thousands of properties in the private sector hands that are PHA low-income properties. And anytime we begin to nickel and dime that sector um, who is in the low-income housing uh, uh, world, um, there is a consequence, particularly in changing neighborhoods, about their willingness to participate in those programs. And I think that's an issue that the councilman and I have talked about. I know we've talked about it with revenue. Um, when you have that many properties, we, we have to be careful that that, one of the things we learned through the mortgage foreclosure is that there's gonna be a long-term need for affordable rentals. And we need to protect that constituency in a way. So it's not an either or, but it definitely is, um, can have damaging uh, consequences. I will share with the chair, um, I sent a, an extensive list request to uh, Revenue and they responded. I have a letter dated March 20th with a lot of the questions that I had posed to the councilman and to, to Revenue around um, putting our hands around the data <clears throat> and, and the information around our payment plans who's paying and who's not paying, who are the big delinquent guys. Um, and, and I must say that I was astonished at the fact that we know who our biggest delinquent folks are. Um, and just to give you an example, one of the, the things that popped out of the delinquent uh, uh, accounts at, at the tune of $4.2 million was Marriott Corporation. And so when we look at this, the top delinquencies, we know who they are, we know where they are. And so the question is, as we improve on our collection rate, what is it that we're doing differently? What is the methodology to go after these huge accounts that represent the largest part of this portfolio? Well, one of the things that we've been doing for the past couple of years now is uh, we, I meet quarterly with, um, different groups. Mm -hmm. We break the delinquencies into categories, real estate tax, business mm -hmm. tax, others, and uh, we meet quarterly and go over the top, essentially the top 100 every quarter and mm -hmm. go through the list of those delinquents. And the purpose of that meeting is to see that there's movement, that we don't have a static group of delinquents that are out there. So we look at a couple things. We look at who's on the list, mm -hmm. who's moving off the list, who's coming on to the list, and the ones that are on the list, what is the status, and what do we need to do um, to keep it moving along in the collection process? And I think that has been, uh, that's been very helpful. It's been so helpful what percentage, for me. going back to what Councilwoman Parker was saying, what is the effectiveness of the methodology 
around those collections, right? If, if you have a quarterly meeting and we have the top 50 guys, what, it, what is it that we do in those, next, in those three months for collection and how effective is it? Well, that's what we're, that, that's what we're using this to determine. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the purpose of the meeting for me to hear mm -hmm. what is the plan on this collection. Mm -hmm. And then to follow up in three months and say what has happened, how effective is that? And basically to move it through the process, you mm -hmm. know? So what is the status? Um, now, some of them are in that inactionable mode, and we broke things, we broke different things down here, different categories, but, um, okay, and they're just giving me the information. The Marriott, a perfect example, that has now been closed and collected. Mm -hmm. So, and that's kind of the process. We look at that, you know, the concern was that there's accounts maybe that had been sitting there and weren't getting attention and just would languish, or that somebody would walk it through walk it through is not the right term, but follow through the um, collection process. And then at the end, if they didn't collect it, mm -hmm. move on to the next case. And it would sit there and then it's just stagnant and it's gonna yeah. be there until somebody else works it. And then we're gonna come to the same solution. So what we found is, you know, by following up every three months, we're going to move these accounts. We're gonna first figure out if there's a reason why it's on there and we can't do anything and we note those. It might mm -hmm. be in um, appeal. So we're waiting, and every three months we're waiting to see what the, when that comes out of appeal, and when it does, we'll be on the collection if, if, if it's found in favor of the city. Mm -hmm. If we put it into another collection status, um, we'll follow up in three months and say, okay, that didn't work, it's still there, what is the status, so, what can we do? Essentially, we may move it to a write-off. It might be something that's there, it's really old, law opines that they've done everything they can possibly do. Usually. Um, the final step of that is um, we brought on two firms to execute on judgments. So it's kind of the, f the last, and Francis, maybe you want to speak to that a little bit. But You're taking up all my time. Let me I'm get sorry. some more <laughs> questions in. It's a complicated I, question. I it is a complicated, and I have a document, and I'll put it on, on okay. the record because I think it really um, speaks to where you've made progress, right? I think there, there's been a lot of progress and, and you know, I wanna get to the bigger accounts and that big number of 200 whatever million. But for me is like really narrowed down in the methodology. You know, as part of our work 10 years ago with the freshmen, you know, we, did, we spent a lot of time working with Rob around auditing, around all of the, the pieces because um, we knew that, that we weren't consistent in our methodology. We talked about, you know, when we send stuff to outside counsel, uh, when does it stay internally. So to me, what, what, what was missing in this response was, what is the current methodology? And to, to Councilwoman Parker's is, how, are, how, do, how do accounts age, right? And who has them at what point? What is the most, effic what is the most efficiency based not only on cost, but around collections. And I think we've gotten to a place where the revenue department really has to define that, right? Because in all of your responses back, depending on the account, I think there was still a lot of nuances to, this is how we're gonna use our outside uh, capacity. This is our internal capacity. And I know that you're, you prescribe to, the, to wanting to build some internal capacity and, and how do those accounts age, right? And so, I think that's one of the, the, the things that has to be clearer to us. I'm all for new strategies, right? I know when Clarina Tolson was there, she tried a few things. We tried some stuff around outside counsel, right? It was a story recently in the paper. Um, there was some discovery work done around that. So I, no one is, wants to hamper your ability to be creative. But I do think that we need to be consistent in the methodology. Based on your memo, um, uh, in, in your responses, you know, we're getting better at knowing who owes. And so I just want to be clear that we're being focused on who owes, particularly when they owe those big numbers, right, and getting them to settle if, if, if we have the capacity to do it internally or externally, right? Because I don't care to, if Marriott pays 18% in collection, right? I would care if a homeowner does, right? Because <laughs> you know, you guys know where my priorities are as, as it relates to that, but I just think that we need to narrow that methodology in a way that, that you, we can explain it to folks that, that we're clear about it and that people do see progress in the context of, 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 a, of a consistent methodology around that. Um, 
I want to speak to the enrollment, and I know we've been talking about getting more creative on enrollment. How are we closing the loop between people who get in tax payments who may not have homestead, and, and why is that not happening? When we're enrolling people, whether it's to the TAP program, whether it's to the UPA or LOOP, how are we, how are we closing that loop? So we're, we absolutely hear you. We've got about 78% of homeowners are enrolled in our programs, the assistance, the relief programs on the real estate side, and obviously Michelle can talk to uh, the water side, which is great, but it's not enough. And so some things we are doing for folks who are in a tax program such as the senior freeze or they're in UPA but we found they didn't have a homestead, we've been able to auto-enroll them because we already know they meet the criteria. So already 3,000 homeowners who are in those programs that predated... When did that happen? Because that... I would say um, August. The answer is August. Did we retro that back to when they entered a, a tax payment plan? Um, I will be able to get that information for you and we can forward that. That's an important point, and I want my colleagues to understand that. We were putting people into payment plans who were eligible for homestead and other stuff, and we didn't capture that. With one step, we enrolled 3,000 people. So my argument is we, we have a lot more capacity than we're exercising. Yeah, and so we are working hard on that. In the past year, the city won a... Um, grant from the Knight Foundation to help us look at this better. There also uh, is a team of students from Temple who spent the past semester, and I see one of them who is your staffer um, here, looking at how do we try and get to a point where there's one form that you fill out and get all these programs. And there are some challenges with that. Some of these programs have different definitions of what counts for income because some mirror a state program for seniors while others mirror utility programs so that they all match up. And so there's some real challenges there, but we're really excited about continuing to work through those to reduce any barrier that if you, so that if you manage to get in the door and start the process in one program, we can really figure out all the programs you're eligible What's for. What's the timeline for that? Um, so we're actually reviewing some of the information we got from uh, that team right now to see what are action steps and figuring out what we can put folks on over the summer to take some of those first steps. Uh, it's possible, though, there may be some legislative changes we need uh, to sort of sync up those definitions around what is income. Because right now, um, if we asked a, a person, say, can you put your household income on a TAP form, they could write down $15,000, but if we asked them to put their income down on a loop form, the answer would actually be $17,000. And that's just because the definitions in the legislation um, don't quite sync up. So there are some challenges there um, that are big, but there's also things that we right now can do um, by reaching out, data sharing among departments, so that where we can make incremental progress, we want to make that as quick as possible, but we also want to understand the big picture so we can all get to the vision of sort of one door into assistance programs. Okay, my okay. time is up, I know. I'll Thank you. Come back Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Green, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm going to follow up on some of the questions that Councilman Sanchez and Parker uh, have asked already. Uh, I want to get some more specific details. Um, for aging for delinquent um, taxes, at what time period do they get referred out to outside council? For real estate tax? Mm -hmm. So um, they go out. They're due, the real estate taxes are due March 31st. By June, we ha they're overdue April 1st. By June, we have them out with two collection agencies. Okay, so you're saying that by June 1st? June. The date has varied, but usually, generally in June, that referral will go out. So, a no, so, so you're saying that that referral is going out to outside collection agencies June 1st and that the city is not trying to collect? No, we delay. are. The reason for the delay is on once it becomes overdue, we want to send one bill out from the Department of Revenue, mm -hmm. one delinquent bill, and give them an opportunity, one overdue bill, and allow them to pay us directly. So we do that. Once we've established that, given it time for the due date and processing time, then we get the referral out to the two collection agencies. They work it through December 31st, series of letters and calls. But in November, they do kind of that um, notice that I referred to, that last notice, kind of the dire notice that says, you know, if you don't pay by December 31st, you're going to have attorney's fees and a lien placed on your property. And that generates a flurry of payments. And then January 1st, we pull it all back from the collection agencies. And then we go through that division, 
and get it ready to go out to our co-counsel. And that goes out in, you know, essentially March, April, we get it back out to co-counsel and then they collect. Okay, I, so you're so using collection agencies um, from June 1st to the end of December. Yes. And then you're pulling it back and then once you go into the new year, then you're sending it out to collection firms? Yes, which are law firms. Right, law firms, okay. You know. And the collection agencies that you're using, those are agencies you've done RFP process that you've been working with over the years? Yes. Okay, and so, any, so at no point is there any um, delinquent bill that um, has occurred prior to June 1st still staying within the city of Philadelphia. It's all going to collection agency. So at the June 1st, any delinquency is going out to a collection agency. It all goes out. And not staying internally. It all goes out. Okay. And then doesn't go to the collection firms until basically January of next year after you've given a time period for collection agencies to collect. That's correct. Is there a reason why we are using collection agencies at one point and then in January going to collection firms? Yes, because when it's overdue, it really isn't ready to go into the foreclosure process. So that's more of a legal process, and it's why we use law firms um, in the January 1st when we put it out. But we use, you know, we can use standard collection agencies. And the other thing is, you know, we're, we're, we're essentially incurring the fee during that period of time. We're not passing an attorney fee mm -hmm. on to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And we found that to be a really effective time period. You know, there's a real opportunity there to collect during that overdue period. It, Great benefit for the taxpayer who may just, for, for whatever financial reasons, is late and behind mm -hmm. to get caught up before the liens are on and the attorney's fees are on. And so, uh, as I said, we started that in 2012. Prior to 2012, we allowed it to just kind of sit with the city and bill it over the year and then put it out with the collection um, with the collection firms the following year when it was delinquent. And we found that it was a real opportunity missed, and this has been really successful for us. And so uh, it sounds like in December, before it goes out to collection firms, when you send that kind of last notice, you're getting an increase in collections? Yes. Is there a reason why we're waiting until December and not trying to do that earlier? Well, we do it earlier, but, you know, it, I guess it's human nature for people to just procrastinate, mm -hmm. and they put it off and put it off, and then that's like that final notice to let them know that this is it. If you don't do it now, January 1, there's no going back. You'll have a lien and you'll have attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. So people are kind of waiting to that point to do it. Um, we've, we've worked with, we've worked with um, University of Pennsylvania, um, did a behavioral science study, worked on different types of noticing, and, uh, and we continue to do that kind of work to find out what noticing is most effective. But considering um, that people have a tendency to um, wait to the last minute procrastinate, would it not make sense to maybe move up that time period by a couple months? knowing that you're going to get more money earlier if you let people know this is the last notice? We, could certainly, it, we can certainly play with the I mean, dates. as opposed to December, maybe, as opposed to December, maybe we did September and then send, and then after people don't respond after September, September last notice, then send the collective firms earlier. Because yeah. that would get us money quicker because we're short on time period. Now, granted, you want to, I mean, some people are doing financial issues and other challenges, but I think that once you get to a certain time period, especially when you're talking um, September from a bill that was due in April, uh, and you say this is your last notice, and then it's going to go to collection agencies, and then start moving forward, then I think you probably get more money as opposed to there's clearly a period of time that people are just waiting for that. I'm yeah. going to wait until I get my final notice. Yeah. So as opposed to giving them more time to get that final notice, why don't we push up that final notice period earlier, and then you can probably collect more. Yeah, we'll give that a try. Because those who are going to pay, they're going to pay. Those who have challenges in paying, they're still going to have challenges in pay, paying regardless if it's September or December. Now, that'd be an interesting project okay. to try that and, and measure the difference in uh, the collection. Okay. Also, um, one of the concerns I've had, and my understanding is about 30 percent of the elder property owners in the city um, do not have the homestead exemption. Uh, and so what are we doing to, and I understand the different types of the income reporting because the state program versus local programs, but I still have a, a major concern on us not using tools at our disposal to better inform constituents of the programs we have. I know we have a lot of different programs with UPA and LOOP. Um, we just announced a, a new initiative yesterday working with uh, Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency and Community Legal Services, which is great, but 
my concern is that we're not getting information out to enough people and it's these one-off events mm -hmm. and people are not knowledgeable of all these type, type of programs. So that is a continuing challenge for us. How do we get, we're at about 78% of homeowners are enrolled in these programs, but there's still 22% um, that we're trying to reach. And so we have a built out communications plan that includes the one-off community events. This year we did 174, which was about um, 40 more than the year before. And those are important, but we're also doing a number of things um, that we're trying to reach folks where they are. So we recently um, did a, a program that we call Tacos and Taxes, where we worked with the council president's office, where we did um, direct invitations to targeted folks to see if we could get them in. Um, and with the lure of some snacks, we figured that actually might be a thing that really works and made sure that we brought our services as well as partners from community legal services and others right into the neighborhood with the um, district council person. And so that was successful um, in the fifth and it's something that we're going to try and reach out um, to other council members to roll out. Other things we've done is within the past year, we added a content manager for our website who happens to be trilingual, which means we're getting a lot more content out of there in ways that folks can access it. So rather than, you know, dense text, legalese, um, information on our website, we've got more videos, we've got blog posts in multiple languages, and we're trying really hard to reach people in the way they want. Uh, recently, we launched our own YouTube channel, and on a per capita basis, we are only slightly trailing um, who were some of the top-notch Department of Revenue YouTubers in the country, Minnesota and New York State, on a per capita basis, where our subscribers are getting up there. Um, we recently actually posted a throwback video you did for the homestead exemption, um, which we really appreciated. So uh, one thing, you know, we, we have been trying to be more creative in how we reach folks. We're really open to ideas and experimenting. Um, we've already mentioned behavioral science a couple times. We really want to try and test and see what is the most effective. So. You know, we'll do something and try and send out a letter two different ways to try and figure out which one is more effective at reaching folks. We did projects a couple years back where we messed with, does a large envelope with handwriting on it work better than a green envelope that's normal size to get folks, to get senior citizens to enroll in a water discount program. So we're constantly experimenting and we're constantly trying to find new partners to work with us. I mean, just coming up with some type of um, branding campaign um, regarding um, ways you can reduce your taxes. I'm not, you know, you can work with, you know, either internally or maybe even reach out to those externally that just want to see a benefit in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, some type of branding um, marketing campaign that's um, a short tagline that people can use and remember and then mm -hmm. constantly repeating it. Because it sounds like there's been a lot of different stops and starts, but in order for marketing to be successful, it's got to be a, a simple, distinct message that's repeated over and over and over again. Uh, there's a reason why GPTMC now visits Philadelphia, that does the, you know, uh, you know, XOXO with love. I mean, they've kind of used that brand and use it consistently. Um, and also working with the district council members. I know Councilman Parker had a very um, engaging um, conversation with you earlier. You know, she does town hall meetings, a number of other council members do town hall meetings, budget hearings. I mean, I think using, we have housing counseling agencies in the city, a lot of nonprofits, but if you have just a consistent message and then asking people to get that information out on a consistent basis to all of these different channels, I think will be helpful. Um, part of the reason why I did the PSA on the homestead exemption and done a lot of Facebook live posts because people don't know about these programs. I've had people from different income levels, a friend of mine um, who's a, recently purchased a home and forgot about the homestead exemption and came up to me after a budget hearing and said, thanks for doing that post because I just remembered doing the homestead exemption. I kind of forgot about it. Mm -hmm. So people have a tendency to forget things at time, but we have to constantly re remind them. And I don't think we're using all the tools all, or all the arrows in our quiver. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Heenan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you know, welcome to City Council. Thank you. Uh, you know, but you know, I do want to start off by uh, recognizing uh, the changes and the progress that you and the team has made together. I think when um, when I first started to serve, along with uh, colleagues, we were at like 90, 92 plus percent on its uh, collection rate, and you know, to move to move the needle, uh, you know, for for the right reasons, you know, for the department, for the efficiency of the city, and for the general public. You know, we're now at 95.5, and you know we want to get up to 98. Is that our ultimate goal? 
98. 100 is, is always 100, the goal, but uh, yeah. 100, but <laughs> 98 you know, would be nice. Realistically, <laughs> realistic, if we, we get to 98, you know, uh, I think that's uh, an attainable goal on, on the path that we're taking. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that you, you, you know, where we were then and where we are now, I mean, it, you know, because we were going through AVI and, and the changes in our real estate, uh, the bar, you know, um, uh, you know, actual value of our, our real property here in the city of Philadelphia um, and to current, you know, we're trying to tweak and modify and, and, and adjust as we, as we go on where we, where we see problems. Hence, you know, a lot of the programs for people protection, right, for people who, you know, you don't want to put out on the street or people who want to get into payment programs, people who's um, real estate taxes have gone up, um, um, you know, 400%, you know, we, I mean, we started at, 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 at a 300% qualification for, for some of them. Uh, but uh, would it be fair to say that uh, when recognizing uh, different uh, solutions or identified problems that you're able to work things out and adjust? Would that be a fair statement? I think so, yes. I think so. Okay, so uh, we, in 2012, you know, with the change in, to AVI, there was, uh, there's a billion dollars in uncollected taxes, and then there was $800 million in uncollected taxes, and then there's $600 million in uncollected taxes, and today, not, I mean, and nothing is inconsequential. I mean, everything really, every penny, every dollar, everything counts uh, for our core services as, as City of Philadelphia without putting an undue burden on uh, additional taxes, uh, collective revenue from our residents. Uh, but we're down, we're, we are now, I think, uh, sifting through all that and, you know, we have an actual number of just principal only of approximately $200 million. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so as we progressively uh, get sharper and better and use technology to our advantage. Uh, there was one thing that I heard several years ago and I haven't heard much until today's hearing is a sequestration. Uh, and there was a big talk about that uh, initially a few years ago. And there was a, a we had a, a pilot program. Is that is that correct? I mean, was it? Yeah, I think we started using um, sequestration back in 2013. That's when we started to get some additional tools. Um, that and Cal revocation, both of those have been really. That initial pro that initial pilot program was pretty successful. Yeah. Would you say you? you it, w it was usually successful. I think it took like 50. I mean, and I'm just recanting off of memory. I think we used you know like 50,000 uh, properties as a. I mean, there was a sole, yeah, I'm forgetting sole, what was in the pilot project, segment. but as was, uh, as was noted earlier, sequestration's bringing in about um, $1.5 million a month, I think, uh, collections to date since that program started are over uh, $70 million. So that's so been, over the five years, that yep. would be, uh, if you're doing one, I mean, so, I mean, that's a, you know, it's not it, chump change. It's a game changer. Yeah, that <laughs> and Cal a, revocation game were changer. game changers. And, yeah. and it's a new tool. I mean, the, the state passed a bill, uh, Act 135, uh, which is similar, right, because that's, you know, sends a property through the courts uh, under re receivership, which would now be the city would act as the managing agent for that property in, 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 in collection of, of their rent. Is that, is that correct? Uh. Yes. And, and those... And those tenants would be offered the same services and opportunities for any other kind of uh, services that the city has to offer regardless. So none of that changes. That's right. This is more to the irresponsible and flagrant uh, uh, delinquent owner of the property and, and its failure to pay taxes. That's right. And they're income producing property. So essentially we can, we can take the income use it to pay the taxes, and then turn it back, the receivership back to the owner after the, after the taxes have been and, paid. And I, and I think, and I just want, want to be clear, we want the city to know that we're going after the bad actors. We are. People who are, are flagrantly and willfully not paying their taxes while collecting rent or while making an investment, whether it's you know, commercial property or investment property in residential, uh, you know, that we're going after them. And we're going after them with 
with uh, newly created tools and tools that, that have uh, become available uh, either through a pilot program or through best practices. Is that correct? That's right. And, and uh, one of the nice notes uh, for the sequestration program is now being enhanced this year because for the first time with the new data warehouse in revenue, we're able to match rental licenses to properties. When we first started sequestration, we were basically just throwing stuff out and seeing what was an income producing property. Now we know, we can know who has a rental license and target those properties. We also are expecting to get, start to get lists from L&I, which has been going after people who, ha who don't get rental licenses and finding them, and then they're gonna tell us this person is renting on the sly, and we'll put that pro property into sequestration if it's delinquent. And, and Ms. Beckley, I mean, as you, as you recall, and we've been working with your office, I, I, I'm gonna speak for the six council Matic district, right? We are tired of people who are collecting rent and not being registered with the city of Philadelphia. When you talk about an underground economy, all right, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, fairness and, and having, uh, uh, you know, treating even the tenants with, with respect, all right, that's, that's called fairness. And, and if somebody is uh, skirting, you know, a housing rental license, right, they're skirting a lot of other things, all right, and that's not paying their taxes, that's not, you know, making sure that their property is maintained and they become a uh, blighted nuisance property in our neighborhood, which then destroys the quality of life of a block, which then you know, it destroys the quality of life of the neighborhood, which devalues the, the property value in our neighborhoods. That's, that's how it works. And that is, and we can quantify this, all right? And we right. have quantified this with yeah. delinquent tax, delinquent tax uh, deadbeats, all right, who willfully are breaking the law and collecting, and collecting rent and or other, you know, other uh, uh, products and businesses if they're commercial, uh, and property maintenance violations and not having any housing inspection violations. And I can't emphasize enough that that decreases the values, and I, I've, I did the data, all right, by 20% in the neighborhood. And that's what makes neighborhoods, all right, in part, all right, decrease its value, invites crime, let's give people the, the wrong message uh, that it's okay to do illegal things in this neighborhood because look at it, all right? Why? Why? Right, because we allowed it. So I'm glad that, that we're really cracking down and not allowing it. And I, I'm not going to allow it in the 6th District, and I don't think any other council member wants it happen in, in our thing when, in their neighborhoods when we're trying to figure out the best way to improve our collection rates just on real property, and not, not including any other uh, delinquent taxes or business taxes, For just, sure. just real estate taxes. But, but I think the cooperation, certainly we applaud the uh, support of your office and city council and the communication within city government. You know, we talked a little bit about how we're talking to L&I and other departments. We're working with other departments. We have new tools like the data warehouse. Okay. And we have I, new I, I know you are, and I'm, I'm a big, big fan of data warehouse, yeah. right? This, that's a profile of, a pro, of, of an address, yeah. all right? What's going on with this address right here? Right now, it took a lot of a long time to get to where we are, right? But we are where we are now, and we need to utilize the heck out of it, right? To to ensure, right, this mass hysteria, you know, that that some of the community members and and, and the city may be facing when, you know, every time we turn around, you know, we're we're having a conversation about taxes, right? Well, we're doing something about it, and we have the the, the data to do so. I got two last questions, real, and I'll be real quick. So it's been. You've already stated that we're using new tools. You're, you're always open for sharpening up our toolbox. Sequestration all right, was a new tool. It works, it's effective. We're gonna to continue to do that. We're gonna ramp up on it. And what about tax security, uh, securitization, tax liens? All right, that is another toolbox. So if we have through tax secure, if we have through sequestration a 75% uh, rate of return, all right, when people, uh, you know, starting to pay their taxes because, you know, more notifications, right, and notifications in a different way with different language, all right, than you normally have. Uh, can you, and, and uh, sheriff sale, what is our sheriff sale, uh, that, that, to your knowledge, uh, when things are, uh, properties are taken to sheriff sale, what's the compliance rate on that? It's, it's yeah, high. so I, I right? can't. We have, we have the numbers. I think it's interesting to watch. You know, if we, if we request 12,000 ticks and put 
essentially set up 12,000 accounts for sheriff sale. The melt, and it really comes from the noticings, to the time, to the time of sheriff sale, that's down to about 4,000 accounts. So 8,000 accounts will just rectify through the noticing. Exactly. So to your point, so the to, power to my of point, we notification. Have the, the power and tools of notification in different ways effectively all right, for people who are delinquent to get it, to get in compliance or, or to uh, take advantage of the programs that we're actually promoting right. with the city along with those notices. So and securitization. So 75% high on sheriff sale and tax lien securitization is 85%. Why are we not doing tax lien securitization with the city of Philadelphia when we have 67,000 tax uh, uh, delinquencies that, that are out there and only, uh, how many are uh, uh, non-owner occupied? Yeah, yeah about, um, what do we have, about 16,000 so, are, are owner occupied, 21%. So only 16,000 are owner occupied. That yeah. means 51,000 properties are non-owner occupied. Right? And you have attorney fees right, that are you know, more, more than less than half, I mean, it's in line with sequestration, right? 6% or 6.6%, .6%, right, for sequestration. I don't know why we're not using those tools. So securitization right? is certainly a tool that we want to look at and we want to have the power to do. Um, and, you well, know, why don't, we do, why, why, don't, why, don't we, why don't we just do it? What is to stop us from, from just Well, the, to bring in a manager to do securitization is a multi-year co contract and we need um, council okay. approval to well, do that. I'm going to urge, right, and ask my colleagues in the city, you know, in, in, in this body, all right, to take a look at the policy, all right? You know, if, uh, you know, 75%, 85%, 90%, um, you know, these are all good uh, programs effectively all right, going after our tax delinquencies that, that are out there when it, when it comes to real property. Not included any other, you know, delinquency right. taxes, because we can add that all to the pack in a time when we desperately need so. Our schools are, are, are uh, in, in disrepair, our, our public properties and uh, our, our rec centers are in disrepair. So we're trying to do something. We're really trying to, to uh, present good ideas. And I know we've been working with you, but, you know, I just, I had just urged this body to, to consider it publicly you know, at a hearing and uh, see where we go. But there's no reason why not to if there's protections for people and social service, wraparound services that we already have in place, right, where nobody will be displaced. You've already proven that with sequestration. Yeah, so, no owner-occupied properties would be included. No in owner-occupied. Thank you so much. Yes. Right, okay. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Just follow real, real quickly on that. Um, on that issue, if you strip out the uh, owner-occupied properties, um, of that of that's what's remaining. A lot of them have been on the books for a while. I, I guess what I'm getting at is how much is that is really collectible in your well, opinion? Well, 158 million is our active principal balance. So that's newer than 10 years. Um, that's our most collectible. So that 10 years is the, then another yeah. 40 million in principal, approximately 40 million in principal. That's older, a little more challenging to collect. You know, but as has been stated, you know, this is real estate taxes, and there's you know, first priority liens on all of these properties. And I've been around long enough to have seen times where we were asked, why aren't you writing off certain delinquencies no, right. 20 years ago? And now those are really valuable properties and that money's rolling in as those properties sell. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Gim. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so I had a couple questions about the school district and the city's distribution of the millage checks. Could you just um, clarify for me what is the school district portion and what is the actual city portion? I understand the distribution is 55-45, but could you give me the numbers? Oh, um, you have the numbers <laughs> Sorry, in front of us? I, we should. I, I, I can Google it. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And um, one of the questions I also had is for each incremental change in the transition, how much money are we roughly talking about? So I, I understand about the percentage ratio difference, but how does that translate into actual millage rates and what amount of money would we be talking about? Does that make sense? So for example, the if you were to say 
the millage rate was 1.4, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it's 0 0.77 school district, 0 0.63 to the city if it's a 55-45 distribution. Um, to move the school district to like a 56-44, 58-42, and 60-40, what kinds of, what are we looking at in terms of amounts of money so per incremental change? W what we could do is provide for you like a little calculator that would mm -hmm. let you toggle that if you moved it to, you know, instead of 55-45, if you kept the total rate constant, what would those rates have to be? We're, we're able to provide that, and I think I'm about to be able to provide you with the numbers for the current millage rates, except for I scrolled, I scrolled. Um, Oh, nope, this is, okay, so the total is 1.3998, and we will get back to you with how that is divided between the school and the city portion. Wait, I'm just bad at cell So phones. if it's like a 55-45, is it literally 0.77 goes to the school district and 0.63 goes to the city? Oh, okay, yes. So it is 0.6317 goes to the school, to the city. Right. 0.7681 goes to the school district for a grand total of 1.3998. And as I said, as you move percentage-wise up um, between the two numbers, if it were to stay steady, what amount of money are we talking about in terms of each percentage transfer? Does that I, make sense? So, like uh, right now, this is a this is the point seven six eight one for the school district of Philadelphia is determined by a forty five a fifty five forty five split between the school district and the city. Is that right? So the I, I, do you want to give the legal answer of how the rates well, are? Yeah, I mean, legally there are two separate taxes and they're yes. imposed separately. So that it isn't a question of imposing this and then splitting it up. It's whatever you rate, however you raise the proportional rates because you pass each tax in a, in a separate ordinance. And it's my understanding that the proposal for raising taxes is to do, is to maintain the 55-45 split. Um, I think we'll probably need to defer to budget and finance at the tax bill hearings later today because I think they'll have a better handle on that. Right. And one option is solely to look at the school district portion. It's, oh, it's not. Um, hang on one sec. We're... Good afternoon, Rob. Good afternoon. Now, the proposal is to raise the school district portion. And that will then change the percent. So that then there'd be a higher percent that was on the school district side than on. And do you know what, I think what that will end up I think it gets at? up to about 58. 58 percent. I think. Okay. I'll have that for you this afternoon. But I think that's So it is. isn't an even distribution between the city and the school district? The increase is solely the for the school, school district. district. end of it. Yes. Understood. Okay. Thank you very sure. much. Okay. And I guess my uh, only other follow-up, Rob, is that if, if that transfer, if there's a city transfer, how, what incrementally does that begin to look like? Or can I just figure that out by doing the math? Um, the so you mean if we just shifted the millage? Shifted. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the questions that we got, I think, actually from Councilman Sanchez was about what each, millage each point. 20 million is worth. 20 million. And, um, I think that went over yesterday, so you should have that in writing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want a few follow-up uh, comments and maybe a question. But I wanted to clarify that taxes are a first lien on real estate. They come before any other debt, including mortgages, lenders, et cetera. So whether it's 10 years or 20 years, we will get paid. And this is why this piece is important. On the books today, I just got the information from revenue, uh, I think it's from your records, we have 90,000 delinquent properties in total. We have 461 million of outstanding and market value of 9 billion. My point is that the lean to value ratio of the total portfolio is closer to 5%, 5%. On the owner occupied, when you take them out, there's still about 215 million of non-owner occupied delinquency. It's 215 million against 5.7 billion of real estate. These are people who don't use this as their home. They are, their real estate's worth 5.7 billion and they owe us 215 million. And their loan to value is 4%. We will get paid on a lot of that. 
a lot of it, 4%. The national average is if you get above 40 or 50%, you're not going to get paid. We are at 4%. We're going to get paid. So um, I just want to put those statistics out there. I really don't have any other questions for you, though. But thank you. And I want to just reiterate what my colleagues have said. Well, you, Commissioner, you and your department are doing a very good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. And I, I said this after Councilman Don, because he accuses me of saying every time before him uh, that we are running late. So if, if we could make this the last round, that would be good because the, the uh, BRT has been waiting a long time and then we got more this afternoon. Thank you. Councilwoman Sanchez. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, quickly, I know that we've been talking about and, and um, Rob had committed to this. What is going to be our outreach effort for the 28% unenrollment for Homestead? And then how are we going to tie that into TAP? And will council have an, a role in that moving forward, similar to we did what we did with the ABI um, campaign? I'd say absolutely we have an outreach plan that we're putting together that will engage uh, council in. We know that actually you're some of our best referrals when it comes to that. One of the things um, that we've done is continue to upgrade the online portions and recently we did training for uh, council constituent staffers around some of our programs and we continue to put videos of those trainings for council staffers up online so that your folks can really help us out. Um, there's a number of things that we can utilize getting stuffers into utility bills with PTW, with WRB on the tax side, and there's been a really robust plan on the water side. I don't know if you, Michelle, want to mention anything, but if you don't want to, I can keep going. <laughs> Michelle Bethel, Deputy Revenue Commissioner. Um, so to piggyback um, um, off of what Marissa said, so the Water Department has taken a very robust um, um, approach with um, outreach for, for TAP. So, of course, um, partnering with um, yourself and other councilmatic districts um, and with our other partners, um, CLS, the Neighborhood Community Centers, um, USEF, um, that's the primary way um, that we're doing outreach in addition to, you know, we had things on SEPTA, we had newspaper ads, and... Last, last time, and this is where I'm getting to, last time we partnered with some of our community stakeholders and we actually hired boots on the ground, people to do door to door. Um, I was in the Northeast yesterday, where, as you know, one of my highest water delinquencies, and, you know, they, one of the things that, that we, we just need to do door to door. I mean, we really need to go door to door and explain to people. They're not reading the circulars. They're not reading. Um, so are we going to be able to have the ability to do that? I thought that was the most effective when we had some of our community stakeholders hiring people to do similar to what we've done with mortgage foreclosure. We did a housing summit a couple of weeks ago um, with our housing providers. And obviously, the Water Department was there. Other than boots on the ground, I don't know what else is going to work. <laughs> we can absolutely look at that. Um, as you know, we also have a very robust outreach program around the federal earned income tax credit. And that this past tax season, we did have a boots on the ground strategy where we're either going door to door or in some instances we're just hitting commercial corridors or we're at county assistance offices, daycare centers, other places. Um, we similarly actually had a uh, boots on the ground effort to uh, ramp up uh, the Philadelphia beverage tax. And so that has been something that's been really effective. Um, so we can take that back and look at how we can reapply that to the homestead and to yeah, the I'd other like assistance. to see how effective our boots on the ground last time w w was and, and just have a budget for it and let's just do it. I just don't want to continue to wait as I watch the water delinquencies, you know, because we have the conversation continue to creep up, particularly in my only middle na income neighborhood. <laughs> Thank, yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Heenan. Thank you, Councilman. Um, and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be quick. A uh, couple things uh, I didn't get a chance to uh, go over in, in our first round. Uh, one, and, and I think it's all important. And I know, I mean, the, I do share uh, some of the, the Councilwoman's concerns with boots on the ground. I mean, it, it, sometimes you know, mail just un unfortunately doesn't doesn't work and it, and it comes down to you know, not necessarily trusting people that's coming to your door, but you have a better connect rate when it, when it comes to uh, some of the things we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so we should consider that. Uh, 
two, two things. Uh, we're, we discussed service issues. And when I say service issues, I mean serving right, and connecting where, where we're using these skip tracer tools and, and some others. And, and everything. So how are we with service issues uh, legally when, when it comes? To, do we know what that rate is of, of connection would be? I, I can from, from the law department. So when we go, when we use some of these other tools, where we have to, you know, when you, you go to uh, seek registration or, or service department or um, if, you know, uh, this body, you know, wants to enter into in which I, I, I implore that they consider uh, a tax lien so, uh, securitization for non-occupied uh, residents, uh, we would need a, a court order. What, what, is, what is the service rate? Or how much of an issue is that going to be with uh, non-service? Uh, I can find, we can look into getting you the exact figures. Uh, it's a little bit like a musical composition. You, you're looking to, as you said, use many approaches. We use skip tracing. I mean, part of the beauty of foreclosure, when we do get to that, is that we don't have to have effective personal service to be able to go forward with a foreclosure action. Um, but much better than serving people when they have debt is preventing them from getting into debt. And I want to take this opportunity, if you'll give me just a minute, to applaud the Revenue Commissioner, because he was really the person who put together the current Commercial Activity License Revocation Program. And better than chasing people after they're in debt is not letting them get there. That program shuts businesses if they're not current. When Garces Restaurant went into bankruptcy last week, they did not owe any back liquor tax. And that's uh, totally to the credit of the, of the Revenue Commissioner and Marco Muniz, who runs the Cal Revocation Program, because if somebody with a liquor license falls be behind on their liquor, they're there, they give them the opportunity, they send them a letter, 10 days, they send them another letter, two days, after two days, they're there with the police, they shut the door, the business is closed until they come current. It's a, it's a fantastic program, and it's so much better than trying to chase people after they owe you money. Just don't let them get into debt. Don't let them get in the hole uh, in the and, first and, place. And, you know, and we certainly don't want to, you know, have to get to, we don't, we have a, by the time you find out that there's a, a service problem or issue, it's kind of late, right? Then we become first priority, uh, which we, which we we're, we're trying to avoid. We want people to, to get on the rolls, enter in agreements, you know, stay, you know, working as small businesses, stay work, you know, stay uh, in the city of Philadelphia, take advantage of our program. So. Um, all right, so service is, is a little bit, but I, I do think that, um, you know, staying on top of, you know, when you talk about uh, license revocation, I, look, if somebody isn't paying their tax and they're delinquent and they're not, and they're willfully just disregarding everything, and we know of a known address, and you know, they're pulling permits, or they're, uh, you know, acting uh, under a, a particular license, no matter what the license is, liquor or not, well, then, the threat of pulling it is, is, I mean, that's their livelihood. So that really kind of shakes them up and it, it gets them in line. And nobody wants to take anybody's property, right? And nobody wants their property taken. I mean, that's, that's real property rights. It goes back, you know, since, you know, uh, I mean, I guess the railroads built in America, you know what I mean? I, but, and it's you know, important to know with that. all of these tools, even with the closure of the businesses, that the intent there is not really to put anybody out of business. A but what, absolutely what not. What generally happens is within 24 hours, the taxpayers come in, entered into an agreement, they're back, they're compliant, and that's why we need tools like foreclosure, cow revocation. I mean, certainly they seem like harsh tools, but sometimes that's what it takes just to move a person into compliance and then they avoid I mean, that I mean, ultimate result. Just, right. Uh, Last, uh, out-of-town investors, property owners, uh, can you, they are the bane of our existence here when it comes to, you know, complaints in our neighborhoods and complaints from, um, you know, council members in this body. We, you know, uh, we've authorized the tools, which I think we already had anyway, all right, but uh, we took it a step further. Um, I mean, so the state authorized uh, and municipalities to go outside the county and enter right. in, into judgment or, um, you know, ask for our, our filing in, in other counties. And we did so here as, as a city council. Uh, do we have a, a, a grasp on 
how many uh, out-of-town landlords that are delinquent and what the value is of that delinquencies in addition to uh, what, have, what steps have we taken as far as action uh, in ratio to the amount of uh, individuals because now we can lean their properties. It, it, their, their other property, their other assets in addition to going after them in their county in which they reside, we can, we can lean their, uh, their assets. That's right. So 5% of the delinquents are out of state residents and that total $7.8 million of principal. What is, that with, what, what is that with uh, uh, fines and penalties? I don't have that in front of me. I just have okay. the principal amount. All but right. six percent are um, out of Philadelphia, within within Pennsylvania, and that's nine point seven million. And we've used that new tool to place nine hundred and eighty-three liens on properties of these out of Philadelphia landlords. And what we do is we we we, we essentially transfer that judgment outside, so they go to sell their property, they go to sell any of their properties, or if they sell that, try to sell that out of, out of city property or refinance that property, and that lien will show up and will have to be resolved before they can, can do that. So that's a really powerful tool. We don't have collection numbers on that. It's relatively new, but we've got those thousands, almost a thousand liens out there, and they will start to pay dividends, and that's, a, and that's an important message to send to people. We're also tweaking it a little bit. We started that as a pilot project. What we were doing was we were transferring the liens without giving kind of forewarning that we were doing that. Um, now we're going to send a notice first that says this is what we're about to do unless you pay, and we're going to measure um, what kind of response that yields. Okay. If, I, and we'll, I'll call you off, offline and see if I can get you know better uh, numbers of what 5% represents and what the total yeah, we can definitely get that and, for you and all that and add a state and where they seem to be if you have 9% in the uh, or 6% in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and then 5% seems to be out, out you know outside of, of Pennsylvania so it's a total probably, 11, probably 11 like Florida or something like that I think they they kind of uh, yeah. Uh, clustered, but uh, we'll, we'll talk offline and we'll get that and we'll have another conversation. Thanks. Okay. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. All right. Councilman Blackwell hasn't had a chance yet. Then Councilman Dom, and then if we could move on, that would be great because we're really behind. Thank you. I have an easy question that someone uh, just asked me. They talked about the transfer tax and how that has gone up, and if there is a way that people can pay in part get into payment agreements because it will help them to catch up and then be able to pay their taxes off. Do we have some uh, system where people can make an agreement on, on that? On, on real estate transfer tax? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that can be done with a law department. We, we do make those, we do make agreements occasionally on those. Through the law department. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of follow up questions. I just want to mention that there are, even though we're excluding from the legislation I introduced, there are owner occupants in this city who are delinquent, who can afford to pay and choose not to pay. And I know in, there's, they're in Center City, they're in the neighborhoods. I see the numbers. So there are people out there who have 500, 750,000, a million dollar homes that aren't paying their taxes, just to put that out there. I want to switch over to the water department for a moment. And I know that in prior hearings here this year, it was mentioned that there's 360 million in water receivables, and it was clarified that about 261 million are actually delinquent, okay? And of that amount, 61 million is for non-residential properties and 200 million is for residential properties. Do we have any program for the 61 million that it's in non-residential properties to collect those delinquent water and sewer bills? Yes. Um, the, for commercial? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, say the question one more time. Oh, the question is, there's, of the total amount receivable, it's yes. 360 million, Delinquent is 261 million. Right. And of the delinquent, about 200 is for residential properties 
And, uh, and by the way, in this category, it was explained to me that there is owner-occupied and investor, but the programs for water and sewer are available to all residential properties. Correct. So my question is on the commercial properties, the delinquency is about $61 million. Um, my question is, what is the program we're using to try to collect that $61 million? Well, the, the first one option for that, of course, is always shut off, just stop service. Um, but what we are very excited about is we are getting closer and closer. We anticipate right now it will begin in September to being able to do full-scale foreclosure uh, for water debt. Uh, state law, tr while water is subordinate to real estate, it is also a super priority lien. For example, it, it will supersede a pre-existing mortgage. Um, and we will be able to refer uh, commercial accounts out to outside counsel as well as we have been doing batches of, of large uh, delinquencies in-house in the law department, but we'll also be able to use outside counsel starting in September. We've just been waiting for the uh, internal computer programming to allow those uh, accounts to be smoothly sent out. So in, in the lien priority, real estate taxes come first, water and sewer come second? Right. Okay. So that means there is also potential here that if we could ever get the legislation passed that I've introduced, that we could also take the 61 million and put it into that grouping of these commercial delinquent utility liens, basically. Yes, and, and you can do a unified foreclosure action for real estate and water in the same court case, okay. um, which is part of what we will be looking to do with outside counsel. That's great. Keep up the good work. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Councilman. Well, thank you all very much for spending your whole morning and, after, and part of the afternoon with us. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, so, again, thanks for all the work you're doing in, in your department. Uh,